What is wrong? Um, so hopefully this will be the last new material that I lecture on for the term. Um, and it's actually a really important topic. That, so I've talked again and again about when you're running a bioreactor, one of the most important things, and, and potentially one of the quite expensive things, is how to sterilize all the inputs. So how do you sterilize the sheer quantities of medium that you need? How do you sterilize all the uh, gas inputs you need? Theo? Um, and actually, uh, this is, has not been as, as well acknowledged, but if you're using uh, an organism that's biosafety level two, um, you have to ensure that it doesn't get dispersed into the environment and make people sick. Uh, so particularly if you're using genetically engineered human cells or uh, something that's making something that's potentially bad for people, uh, you then have to also filter the exits of the uh, streams of gas that are coming out. And those amount can actually be really quite high. So the question is, uh, why do you have to sterilize? Well, if you've taken the yeast lab, you might already realize it. But uh, basically, if you have a nice, warm thing with lots of nutrients and lots of air, sure, your organism of choice will grow happily and well and uh, proliferate like crazy, but so will just about everything else. So there's lots of stuff that's floating around in the air that will come in contact with, or on surfaces that'll come in contact with, if you're not really careful about sterilizing, come in contact with your uh, medium and start to grow like crazy. Um, and then uh, it, even if it doesn't out proliferate what your desired thing is, um, you certainly could have a case where it starts growing and growing and growing and can have toxic byproducts. You at least will have less of the nutrients going to your preferred uh, product. Not a good scene. Um, this is particularly true with mammalian cells. Everything likes growing more than mammalian cells like growing. Uh, so you have to be really, really, really careful with mammalian cells. And when you learn about aseptic technique, which you'll learn about next term, um, everything is a question of risk. So sure, the one time you put your hand over an open culture dish, probably it'll be fine. When you're doing it routinely and you do it a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand times, one of those times something's is gonna drop off your hand and go into your culture dish and your you know, your PhD research will be compromised for two months because you've got contamination, your really critically important thing that you've been working on for ages and ages. Um, you also see, interestingly, and I think this is true actually in uh, the bioreactor industry as well as in uh, academia, the amount of contamination goes way up in the summer months just because there's so much more floating around in the air, uh, nice, humid, warm atmosphere uh, in the summer than there is in the winter time. Um, so, sterility is that you can't detect anything. Ideally, you want nothing. You, um, it's impossible to go and screen every microliter of medium for, for everything, but you check uh, certain amounts and there you want nothing that's detectable. Um, and essentially, your goal is to kill everything in your medium, kill everything that is in uh, your gas before you introduce your desirable uh, organism. So how could you do that? Microwave. So actually, that's an interesting idea. Um, what would the microwave do? Heat up popcorn for 30 seconds? No. So, so, it, it boils, so boils 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 heat up your awesome. medium a lot, right? Yeah. So you're, you're giving it heat? Yeah. But you can use any form of energy. Like radio so radio. any, whether it's microwave energy or you're yeah. making it hot in other ways, uh, heat is probably the, the key and most important way that things are sterilized. Uh, what else could you do? And what we're going to talk a lot about uh, how heat energy works and how we're going to quantify it. Spray with some caustic chemicals. So uh, usually the ca caustic chemicals are um, they 
they're, they're good at decreasing the number of cells and they clean it really well, uh, but you can't count on that necessarily for doing 100% cell death. So usually your first step is a caustic chemical clean and then a sterilization step, particularly of equipment. Um, obviously, caustic chemicals are not the way that you're introducing caustic chemicals into your medium. It's really, it's helpful for equipment. It's not helpful for uh, sterilizing medium because mm -hmm. how do you separate the caustic chemicals out from your growth medium so that, yeah, you killed everything in it, but now you don't want to kill your organism that you're trying to grow. Um, so that's true, actually, of a lot of chemical approaches to killing things. So there are a lot, um, you know, when you are in the hood, you wipe it down with 70% ethanol because that kills a lot of stuff. And a lot of equipment cleaning is done with 70% ethanol to make the surfaces of equipment clean. But obviously you can't introduce 70% ethanol into your medium or 70% ethanol into your gas. Uh, but it is, it is a way that you can sterilize surfaces. Um, along those lines, uh, what else could you do to sterilize surfaces? So some, some uh, say, hospital equipment can't deal with heat treatment. Um, it'll actually degrade the polymers that are uh, important. So what do you do? Yeah. Use UV. So UV sterilization is actually quite effective um, on surfaces. Uh, the key is it has to get to the surface, so any, anything that's shadowed isn't going to be effectively sterilized. How far do you think UV penetrates? I actually don't know the answer to this uh, quantitatively, but how far do you think it would penetrate through liquid medium? What do you think? Just yeah. order of magnitude. Doesn't it go like until it hits like it shines through clear water? Doesn't it hit it aside? It shines through murky stuff and stuff. So it, it actually doesn't go through UV. Doesn't go through water very well. So if you're um, <laughs> so actually Theo and I walk, watched Octonauts last night, and on Octonauts they had an albino whale that got a sunburn because it spent too much time near the surface, but if it spent more time underneath the water, it wouldn't have got a sunburn. The things you learn from children's television. Uh, but the, the truth is UV doesn't go very, like I would say maybe, <laughs> maybe a centimeter into the medium, uh, you'd have effective UV penetration. I, I think probably not even that far. So if you've got, liters and liters and liters and liters of medium, uh, having 30 minutes of UV penetration throughout the medium within a centimeter of the surface is probably not easily achievable. Right. So you actually do see some plants where they, they stream it, um, like a wastewater treatment, they'll, they'll stream uh, past a, a, like in a, in a thin film, they'll stream past a UV source, but they're not aiming for the same level of sterility as you have to in a a bioreactor situation. Um, so UV doesn't work, it, it works pretty well for surfaces. Um, it doesn't work very well for, but surfaces that are not shadowed in any way. It doesn't work very well for liquid medium. Yeah, isn't UV what you use for house systems? I'm pretty sure my house has a UV filter on it. We're on, we're on well water that you can install. Yeah, so there it's, you've got a thin <coughs> amount, like it's, you're not trying to do a huge volume at a time. What you're doing is you're passing a thin film of, of liquid past the UV. Um, and again, you're, and we'll talk about what levels of sterility you need, but the levels of sterility that you need for a very large bioreactor are actually incredibly huge, whereas when it's going straight into a person, you actually don't need it to be quite as sterile as that. But yeah, yeah, it can be used for, for water, it's just, how you do it is important. And when it's huge volumes, it's not especially effective. What else could you use for equipment? There are actually two other ways that hospital equipment gets sterilized. Um, one of them is ethylene oxide gas. Uh, so you can actually put your uh, equipment in a little baggie that's sterile inside and uh, or that allows a diffusion of ethylene oxide gas in, and you can have it sterilized by being exposed to ethylene oxide gas for a fairly long period of time. And that's not hard on uh, 
polymers that otherwise would degrade if you put them in a high heat for a long time. Any ideas what the other way is? Pressure. No, not pressure. Actually, a lot of things will stand up pretty well to pressure. Like you know, autoclaving for pressure. Yeah, so the, really the autoclaving is the temperature, not the pressure. The reason you elevate the, the pressure is to get a higher temperature. So autoclaving is actually the key example of how you get the, the high heat. Um, so the other way is radiation. Yeah, gamma radiation. So you can actually uh, expose whatever it is that you're interested in to gamma radiation for a period of time and then ultraviolet. But obviously those things are not, they're good for equipment, uh, they're not useful for very, very large equipment, and they're not useful for medium. So heat is the typical way that it'll be done. Now, with heat, what happens if, so we learned already that you get cell death as you increase the temperature, but it's a, a death over time. Um, so if you expose something to 121 degrees Celsius for two seconds, it may not die, or a certain percentage of those cells may not die. Um, they need longer periods of time, and we'll, we'll quantify that in a second. Um, but what happens also, what else is in the medium other than hopefully not cells? What are you feeding your cells with? Glucose. Glucose. So has anyone put glucose on a or sucrose, actually, probably, but half glucose, half fructose, um, in a cooking pot of the stove, what happens to it over time? Okay. Does it stay white and crystalline? <coughs> no, it caramelizes, right? So if it's hot enough for long enough, your glucose could caramelize. Uh, but that's probably not the bigger issue. What else is in your medium? Nutrients. Yeah, what kind of nutrients? So the metal nutrients, they'll be fine. They're not going to be affected by heat. What else? So I'll tell you for uh, the cell culture, the mammalian cell culture, usually you put in 10% fetal bovine serum. What would be in that? Proteins? Lots of proteins. What happens, we talked in this, about this in the enzyme section, what happens to the proteins when they get high heat over long periods of time? So there's vitamins, there's proteins, uh, growth factors that are proteins. Um, so the, they degrade much more slowly than the cells. So the you know, cells really only need to have you know, a few of their proteins not work and their DNA not work properly in order to not be able to reproduce. Uh, so cells are much more vulnerable to the high heat than all of the other stuff in the medium, so that's how uh, the reason that you can use high heat to sterilize your medium, but you still want to be careful not to leave it at high heats for too long because then you can have some degradation of the really important stuff the cells want to eat. Okay, so how fast do, do the cells die? So if we, it's all about probabilities. So the key is, we're going to call this probability of population extinction. So the, the important thing to realize is, of course, one bacterium can make two bacteriums, which makes four, which makes eight. 16, 32, 64, 128, five, uh, 256, 512, etc. Uh, and all you need is one bacterium in a population in order for it not to be sterile. Right? So that's, especially as we're starting to think about large reactors, and we'll see an example of that, um, the requirements for to have not any bacteria in there are much more stringent, right? So we actually can't have, we can't have just pretty good sterility. You have to have complete sterility. But you don't necessarily know if you're going to have complete sterility, you can have a probability that you'll have complete <coughs> sterility. 
Um, so the probability for a whole population is 1 minus the probability that an individual one dies to the total number of uh, individuals times 0. So be correct that uh, the longer the time, the faster they die, right? Um, so uh, this is basically, I mean, we've seen this model before in cell growth, you know, this is cell death, but we're still doing the first order <coughs> assumption. Um, and it's not necessarily true. Um, so different, uh, if you look at time versus, uh, this is and over and not. So what does your cell number do over time? Um, if you give them different temperatures, so this is say 121, um, you're going to expect those as, as, you, as you decrease the temperature, degrees Celsius, as you decrease the temperature, you're going to expect this to go up and up and up, right? Like your cell numbers that are still alive after periods of time It'll take them, it'll take longer to kill them if you give them a less of a high temperature. So in some cases, and this is um, on, if you put it on a log scale, which is what you want to do, okay, so log scale, um, you, your first order death model tells you that it'll just be like that with your um, decreasing. And that's true, for example, for E. coli. But it's not true for every organism. You see some that start behaving sort of like that. Okay. So in some cases, it may not be appropriate to use your first order death model. So just be aware of the consequences of doing that. Okay, particularly as you get to the temperatures that are not as deadly. Um, so anyone know why I keep talking? Carl talked about 121 degrees Celsius. Why I talk about 121 degrees Celsius? What's the why? Why is that an important number? Well, it's square. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Celsius, so it doesn't work like that. It's because um, two atmos steam at two atmospheres is 121 degrees Celsius. And that's typically what autoclaves get up to, is 101 degrees Celsius steam at two atmospheres. Um, it's a very commonly used temperature. So wet steam is very good at killing stuff. Uh, typically, steam can be supplied at a, a, a temperature that can give you 121 degrees Celsius in your medium pretty easily. Um, so it's possible also to get higher temperature steam by having it at a higher pressure. Um, people do that, and we'll talk about where it gets used like that as well. Okay. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that uh, sometimes you don't have, so this is sterilization time again on the bottom, and n over and not on a log scale. Um, you'd expect at a given temperature, 
that you have, you just have a depth, a depth curve like that. But if you are uh, trying to just sterilize medium that has potentially many different populations of cells, they're not all going to have the same depth curve. So one might look like that, um, another one might look like that, another one might look like that, okay? So all of your depth curves for your different mixed populations, so this is might be slightly different. So even if you have just a single organism in there, uh, it can have different depth curves depending on what form it's in. So if it's free in suspension, it'll have a different response to temperature over time than if it's clumped up uh, or if it's on surfaces. Um, typically things on surfaces are harder, harder to kill just about any way than they are if they're in suspension. Um, this actually happened. Um, so, so generally, I'm, I, I'm like I'm a big vaccine supporter. Um, but when back in the day, they used to use heat killed vaccines, and one of the things that happened is they were scaling up their heat killed vaccine production and uh, trying to scale up steril uh, sterilization techniques. And when they were using really small scale sterilization, they just saw the effect on uh, uh, the predominant population of virus, but uh, I think it was back, maybe bacteria. Um, but there were some that were in clumps and harder to kill. Um, they, were very, they were very rare when they were in clumps and harder to kill. So they didn't see that when they were looking at the small volumes. But once they started looking at large volumes, they were trying to heat kill all of this stuff to make it into vaccines. And there was now enough of that small subpopulation that was harder to kill that they were actually, to a small number of patients, delivering not heat-killed vaccine, but a live pathogen. And instead of inoculating the people against what they were trying to, the disease they were trying not to get, they were actually giving them the disease. Um, so, so you have to be really aware of what the effect is of, of mixed populations. Yeah. You want to be saved or inoculated. Okay. So um, the, the first order depth kinetics, uh, uh, again, uh, aren't necessarily, like just be aware that you can have more than one population, so more than one KD. Uh, and uh, it may not be completely first order in all cases, just sort of to be aware. But it's a pretty good model for most cases. So the question is, how does KD change with temperature? Alpha E. energy of death usually has, it's usually from 50 to 150 uh, kilocalories per gram mole. Okay. Um, so it'll range, it'll depend on, that's very species dependent, uh, what your activation energy is for a, a particular species. Um, and for vitamins, so Much lower activation energy. So the consequence is you're 
at a given temperature, the KD for killing off your nutrients is much lower than for killing off your cells. Right? Which makes is good. It means that you can use high heat. Um, well, wait, don't you want to keep that in your media? Isn't that good? Yeah, you do want to keep it so in your media. So you're frying everything in your media. So if, 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 this, if this number was actually higher than that number, you wouldn't be able to use heat sterilization at all. Because you'd kill off, sure, you'd, you'd kill off your cells, but you'd kill off all your nutrients much faster than you'd kill off your cells. Because it's, no. because it's lower, because that number's lower for vitamins and, and growth factors, it means that we're gonna be, yes, you're still degrading your vitamins and growth factors when you expose it to high heat, but you're not degrading them nearly as quickly as you're killing your cells. Or no. Can you define what that means? Because the way I understand that that is 20 kilocalories is of energy is going to kill all your vitamins but kill none of your cells. Is that wrong? No. Because like 20 is less than the 50. Yeah. So if you use 50, then you could kill the ones with 50 and 20. But if you only had 20, you would only kill the ones with 20. It so seems like it's way easier to kill your vitamins than your no, no, cells. No, 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 no. So, so for a particular, this is the range that it is for, it's not the range that kills it. This is the range that it is for different organisms. So for example, for uh, E. coli, the number is 127. Okay, so within that range. But for E. coli, that number would be 127. So what that means is you stick that 127 in there, and at a certain temperature, it'll tell you what your KD is. So that's gonna be bigger yeah. than the one for vitamins. Right, exactly. So, so say for a particular vitamin, it's 10, right? Then you put that oh, 10 so in there at the same rate, temperature. The growth rate is going to be bigger. So or the, death rate, the so. death rate is going to be much, much smaller. Your inactivation rate for your vitamin is going to be much smaller. So when we put that in there, for how fast you're losing the vitamin, you're losing the vitamin much more slowly than you're killing off your cells. Okay, I, sorry for the confusion. So I'll just put in E G E coli one twenty seven. So it's just saying that organisms generally are somewhere between fifty and uh, one fifty kilocals per mole. That's not saying that they only get killed if you give them that. <laughs> Everyone makes that make sense to everybody. So that isn't like how much energy you actually have to fry them with. That's just like the number that. Right. So remember, like with with chemicals, right? When you're having a chemical reaction, right? There's your activation energy. It's not saying that if you give it that activation energy, so your chemical goes, your say your two chemicals go up. You give it that activation energy that it's necessarily going to go back down and make your product, which is dead cells. Right, so a certain percentage of it will go back and make your product, which is dead cells. But you can give that activation energy still to other molecules, and some of them would still go back to the product, right? It becomes, it's sort of a probability thing, right? That's like high school chemistry. Should be familiar. Everyone with that? Make sense? Okay. Uh, so. One other way, just to, to put it out there, that no one actually talked about that medium is sterilized. Can anyone think what that might be? So heat is super common. We can't use chemicals because it kills, it, it'll kill the subsequent cells. You could use UV if you're very careful about it, but it's hard to do in bulk. Yeah. Can you filter it? Yeah. Yeah, so. So the other way that medium does get uh, sterilized is filter sterilization. Um, so the, the important thing with filters is that you can't have a pore size distribution 
that allows things bigger than 0.2 microns to get through. So you can have bacteria, like basically if you have a 0.2 micron cutoff, it'll make sure none of your bacteria can get through. But if you had a, a pore size distribution that, you know, one in a hundred of the pores was bigger than 0.2 microns, suddenly your sterilization is completely ineffective, right? Because you just need that one bacteria to get through and you're done. So filters are not, they have to be constructed so that they have a very tight pore size distribution and then either they work or they don't. So in those cases, it's not probabilistic. They're just, they're 100% good or they're 100% terrible because they've actually broken. Uh, and that happens. So the, the reason filter sterilization is not always done is because when they break, boy do they break. And you can't necessarily predict it. And particularly um, if you have any kind of a continuous process where it's going and going and going and going, this is actually quite tricky because you can't swap out filters mid-process. It's just not possible. Um, so uh, I would say, like actually in our lab, we use filter sterilization. Uh, if we've got a, a valuable protein sample that we need to add to uh, a medium because we're experimenting with it. So that's the easy, and we don't want to lose the protein. So we'll typically filter sterilize those samples. What would, beyond the, oh my gosh, it can break, what's the problem with filter sterilization? It can clog. Yeah? What happens when it clogs? We'll get like growth on the membrane or something. Yeah, so you potentially you could have stuff growing, uh, growing on the membrane, fouling the membrane. But what's the consequence of <laughs> stuff growing and fouling the membrane? Oh, I can say um, if you keep adding more solution in, it can burst the membrane, and then you're just going to get all your. So why? You're totally right. Why is it burst? Uh, too much pressure. Yeah, exactly. Your pressure drop becomes. Ridiculous. In fact, even with a perfect, nice, clean filter, um, you end up having to pay a lot of money because there's so much pressure drop required just to go across a perfectly clean filter. And then when it starts to foul, which if you're sterilizing stuff and there, you know that there's things growing in it, it probably will. And then you get crazy pressure drops um, and then your filter can fail. Yeah. Wouldn't you also have to put in like various filter sizes? Because like, once you say the bacteria or whatever you're trying to filter are different sizes and you filter one and it's clogged, wouldn't you want to instead like filter like the largest and then like... So typically, like, yeah, typically what's done is they'll filter large particles out first so that it doesn't uh, mess with the 0.2 micron filter. So the 0.2 micron filter is there really to filter out bacteria. So in a biosafety cabinet, that's actually, they use HEPA filters, which are 0.2 micron filters for the gases that go through. So your room air is sterilized by going through a 0.2 micron HEPA filter that takes out all the bacteria. And then you have a clean, sterile airflow that goes in. And then all the exit air actually gets sterilized again with the 0.2 micron HEPA filter before it gets released into the room air uh, because point of a biosafety cabinet is not just that it keeps what is in the hood clean, but it keeps you safe as well. Um, so filters are actually the primary way that, that gases are sterilized. Um, very commonly gases are used with filter sterilization, but that there, the, the pressure drops actually can add significantly to the cost of uh, the whole bioreaction process. So like 30% we're talking to the cost of the process. So it can be really expensive. Um, so typically, medium is heat sterilized. Occasionally, it's filter sterilized. That tends to be the more expensive choice for medium. Um, for gases, it tends to be filter sterilized. Any questions about that? Cool. OK. Um, so if you recall, your probability of well, I told you the probability of extinction, your probability of unsuccessful sterilization is just 1 minus P naught T. So <laughs> that's really what you care about, right? What's your probability that your bioreaction 
action will fail because you'll have something get into it and grow that you don't want to be growing. Okay. And that's just 1 minus 1 minus e to the minus b d t to the n naught. Okay. So it's the same as before, it's just we've done 1 minus that. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? Okay, so <coughs> let's think about what I, I sort of hinted at this before, but if we have two fermenters, a one liter fermenter, and now we're trying to scale up, and it's a 10,000 liter fermenter, okay? Um, We know for our organism, KD times T is 15. Okay? And we know uh, initial spore concentration equals 10 to the, it's actually, that's not N naught, it's N naught per volume. Um, 10 to the 4 spores per liter. I want you to now calculate what the probability of an unsuccessful sterilization is for both. Just use that. So first, the key thing here is that you're going to have a different end dot because your end dot is actually your number. Okay, so in this case, we only need to sterilize 10 to the fourth spores. In this case, like 10 to the 8 spores, right? So the only thing that's going to be different, we're going to have the same KDT. The only thing that's going to be different is that. So what are our two probabilities? Be like really high. Like, what are you thinking? Like four nines and seven. Dude. Point. So nine nine point nine nine seven percent. Uh, did you do the one minus? No, that was for probability of actually doing it. Okay, so you're trying to think about the so one minus that. What's that? Four zero point two. Yeah, I don't know if that's right, but it's like you got the ballpark. Uh, I've actually got there four zeros then a three. For one liter. Oh, four zeros or two? Oh, two zeros and a three. For one liter. Uh, my technique is better. Yeah. Oh, sorry, no. Is that percentage or is that? No, no, that's just your number. Your percentage would be 0.3%. I, I got that. Okay, so I'm not out to lunch. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's cool, guys. Don't worry. Okay, so, so make sure that you can get that. Um, but now for the 10,000 liter, did you? Yeah, I got mine again. Did you do the calculation on yours for the 10,000 liter? Yeah. What was it? Uh, for the 10,000, I got one. Yeah. So for a one liter fermenter, you have a 0.3% chance that it won't work. For 
the 10,000 liter fermenter, you're pretty much guaranteed that it won't work. Okay. So what I did is I told you that KDT equals 15. The way to make it work is you're going to have to increase T a lot to make it work. Okay, so suddenly you're going to have to spend hours and hours and hours heating all of that medium up because if there's just one cell in a 10,000 liter fermenter, it fails. So it's much easier to get just one cell in a or get down to below just one cell in a, a one liter fermenter, it's much, much harder to get down to just one cell in a 10,000 liter fermenter. So you're gonna have to increase your time dramatically to balance off that problem. Right? Um, so any questions about that? Yeah? So the probability of unsuccessful strategy, that's like the number of cells. So, no, 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 all you need is one cell. That's one right. cell and it's not successful. So you've got a probability that you get down to zero cells. Okay. So based on the number of cells that we have. Yeah. Right. So so if we just look at this part, <coughs> if you've got an initial cell number of n naught, this is the probability that in your population you have no cells left, like none at all. So. Your, your goal is to get no cells at all left. So this is your probability that you have no cells at all left after that period of time. So unsuccessful is one minus that probability. So anything one or over makes it unsuccessful. So it could be 100, it could be 10, it could be one. All of those things would mean an unsuccessful sterilization. Okay, that makes sense? Okay. Okay, so it's kind of a pain in the butt to calculate um, all of this. Okay, so there's actually sterilization, and there's a sterilization chart in your uh, textbook. So figure 10.2. Instead of uh, doing your calculations, it has 1 minus p. So that's your probability of unsuccessful sterilization on the y-axis. And then it has KT on the x-axis. And it has a bunch of lines that go like this. Okay. And then each of those lines are what your initial cell number is. So it starts with 10 to the 0, and it goes all the way up to 10 to the 12. Okay. So what you can do if you have figure 10.2 in front, or sorry, 10.12, oh, 10.14, my bad, 10.14. You have figure 10.14 in front of you. If you know that you have an, an initial cell number of 10 to the 7, and you know that you have to have a probability of 99% that it'll be good, okay, then you can say, okay, there, there, now I need a KTT or a KT of X that you pick off the chart. And knowing what your KT is, you find out what your K, KD is for your organism. And then you say, if that means that I need that much time in order to sterilize it successfully, given my size of fermenter with the number of initial spores and so on. So you can see too that it's also really sensitive to the number of initial spores. So probably you can have a pretty good guess uh, with medium that's being made up. Your number of initial spores is probably going to be pretty low. And there are actually things you can do in your process that might make your number of initial spores lower because you, you create it fairly aseptically or so on. Maybe not 100%, but fairly aseptically. Um, on the other hand, when things are leaving your process, your n naught is going to be really, really high. So if you have to be sure that you're killing everything off, then it could be much harder to kill everything off with heat at the end of a process. Okay, you had a question, Carl. Um, yeah, so you just said that when you're in that, you need your n naught and your 1 minus p, and you find a kt. How do you get 1 minus p without having a kdt? 
it's crazy. Like what we just did here is meet a KD. So, so this would be something that you know based on what you want in, as your process parameters. My goal is oh, oh, having a, okay. so when you're designing a, a bioreactor system with a sterilization system, you say my goal is that 99.9% .9 of the time it succeeds, only one in a thousand times do I have an unsuccessful fermentation because I have a sterilization issue. So you can decide from a design point of view what your pros or what your probability of an unsuccessful sterilization should be. You can never get it to zero, but you can get it, depending on what you're willing to do to your process, you can get it really low. And that tells you then how long you have to sterilize things. Okay. Um, so there are two different ways you can sterilize things. You can do it batch. So you, we talked about that. You can stick everything in a big tank and get it up to 121 degrees for the amount of time that that, that tells you if you should do it. Um, that can be problematic because it takes so long to heat up a large volume of liquid that you're actually now spending a lot of time, you know, you're trying to get it to 121 degrees, you're spending a lot of time at 100 degrees, 110 degrees, 115 degrees, and during that time, you, because it's such a long period of time, you can actually start to have your uh, vitamins and nutrients uh, break down. And it takes a long time for it to cool down because it's just such a huge thermal mass. And we already talked about how you can't use a CSTR to do it because there's a range of residence times. Um, but people will essentially use uh, sort of like a plug flow reactor. So the, you have a tube, and the medium will continuously flow through the tube, and the tube is maintained all at 121 degrees Celsius. And it's, you can do that, for example, by injecting steam at the start of the tube at a high temperature. And in one minute, Theo, and uh, it'll be maintained at 121, and then it can be cooled quite rapidly at the end. So essentially there you have to figure out what the residence time is, given a flow rate in uh, your tube, what the residence time would be in the tube to allow the continuous sterilization to happen. So next, I said I was hoping to get through this. Um, next class we'll just do a couple of examples uh, of sterilization. Um, and then uh, we'll spend a little bit of time.